everybody, welcome along to episode 106 of Percussion Discussion. Before we get started, I'm going to ask you to please check out all of our social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and of course our world famous YouTube channel. On this channel, you can uh, watch as well as listen to the interviews. And the great news is there's no adverts on there. I've taken those off many many, many months ago. So you don't have to sit through any adverts. Um, but please subscribe because it helps other people find the podcast as well. So uh, that would be great. Uh, if you'd rather listen on the go, then they are all available in podcast form and you can download these from your favorite podcast providers. Uh, please rate and review that also if you get a second. Um, five stars would be amazing, but whatever you think. Uh, again, it helps other drummers find what we do here. On to today's guest, um, an amazing American drummer, definitely from the heavier side of things, from his early days uh, in, in the New York hardcore band Nausea, uh, right through some incredible bands, Soulfly, uh, which was um, a band with Max Cavalera from Sepultura, onto Stone Sour, um, some, some other bands in between, but I'd be here all day telling you about them. But for the last few years, he has been the driving force behind... Um, industrial metal giants ministry it gives me great pleasure to welcome the fabulous roy mayorga roy thank you so much for doing this really appreciate you giving up your time thanks for having me no it's an absolute pleasure and before we get started i always like to credit whoever's put us in touch and uh it's our mutual buddy john tempesta this time so that's right thank you, thank you john for uh for, for connecting us up it's appreciated italian stallion Hey, absolutely. He he actually uh he shared a video <laughs> of you playing his uh his concert tom kit in his in his room. So uh, that was quite cool. He sent he sent it to me. Oh my <laughs> Yeah, that, that that kit's ridiculous. I still have to go over and try that thing. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. It is. Yeah. No, it's it's uh, but thank you, John. As, as I say, it's always appreciated. Um, you know, when some Yeah, John's the best. I love John. He's my brother. He's, He's a good have you known have you known each other a long time? Oh yeah, very long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A few decades net by now. Yeah. Oh right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Well, he's a long since, time, man. Ever since he's been uh, a guest on here, uh, probably two, three years ago, he's been so kind, helping me out with guests and uh, suggesting people. You know, so it's always it's always appreciated when someone takes the time to do that. So yeah, he's 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 great all around, man. He's he, he knows a lot of people. He's like the king of networking. He just he just he just knows everyone. Yeah. Everyone loves him. He's the best. Yeah, simple as that, really, isn't it? Simple yeah, as that, basically. <laughs> so, at the moment, how's things going for you, Roy? All good? Uh, for right now, yeah. Right now, I'm just actually uh, just wrapped up on recording some new uh, music with Ministry, and uh, um, I'm going to start touring with them in April into mm -hmm. into May. That's as far as I know for right now. Yeah, and just uh, you know, just writing my own stuff right now, making a library of music for you know have it on the have it on the side while i wait for some other scoring jobs coming for film yeah so, so um, yeah um i mean the As ministry right the ministry gig must be an amazing gig anyway um because oh it's the, awesome such a back catalog of great albums and songs yeah from a long time you know yeah for, i mean from a drummer standpoint it's a lot of fun to play i mean it's just full of salt for like 90 minutes just <laughs> You know what I mean? It's uh, it's, it's relentless. It's, it's there's no letting up on it. You you, you got to be spot on with it. It's it's fun, you know. Yeah, it's really fun to play with them. And uh, Al's great. I love playing with them. He's a great guy. The whole band I'm playing with, uh, uh, Monty Pittman, Caesar Soto, and uh, Paul Demore, the original bass player from Tool, JB keyboardist from Fear Factory and Killing Joke. I mean, you can't get any more solid than that. Yeah. Probably one of the best bands I've played with in a long time it's so tight and yeah and just as 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 people we get on really well uh, off stage so that that's definitely a, a big factor right there that makes us really tight um, um what's it like working with al because he's got a pretty unique voice hasn't he let's be honest um it must, oh yeah it must be pretty cool <laughs> i mean it's amazing like for the amount of years he's been doing it that he still has a voice i mean that guy's a yes. tank i mean He's had so many different things thrown at him, you know, throughout his life that definitely could have killed him, and it did it. And it's, uh, I mean, he's pretty strong. He's stronger than ever now, and he's he's on a good path, and he's in a good space, and he's just wonderful to work with. He's funny. He's really fun to work with. 
And does yeah. his voice ever give up, or does it just just keep going all the time? No, it's he's pretty solid all the time. It's it's like I said, it's incredible to me that he can do it the way he does. Still, it's it's insane. He never phones it in. That that's like one hundred percent. He's just the whole time. That's incredible because yeah. that's full on, isn't it? Especially on the older tracks. Yeah, yeah, just amazing yeah. stuff. Are you looking forward to the tour? Is that going to be? That should be pretty good. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm definitely looking forward to any kind of tour, any kind of you know concert to play because I mean we've all been off for so long, you know, like you know a couple of years, and I haven't really you know I haven't really toured toured since like probably two mm -hmm. ministry last year. It was about a month, you know, six week tour, but that's about it. And before that it was 2019 was the last time I really did a full on tour. Yeah, and that was with uh, Hell Yeah. Yeah, and before them was with Stone Sour. Stone Sour was was the was probably the, the longer run because that was like a good you know, I would say a, a year, hmm. year and a half. So I haven't had a tour like that since 2017, 18. It's been a while since I've toured. It's a long time, extensively long like that. Yeah, so I'm did looking forward to you know anything oh, coming my way. Sure. Did Did you manage yeah. over over the COVID years? I know COVID's still a thing, but it hopefully it's in the background now. Did you manage to keep in shape chops wise um through COVID? Did you play did you play a lot? Yeah, I play pretty much every other day like I like I do now. I mean like I play maybe once you know, I play like, you know, four or five times a week, a few hours a day, you know, just jamming to whatever and keeping in shape like that. Um and when I'm learning other people's music, when I'm doing session work, you know, so I'm I'm constantly practicing. I don't I don't stop. Unless I'm going to go on like a vacation, I'll stop. But I'm always constant with drums. Yeah. Um, through the pandemic, though, I, I, not only was I playing drums, I also uh, was lucky to land the job to score the movie for uh, the Foo Fighters, hmm. Studio Six Six Six. So that was taking up a lot of my time as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And a great yeah. film it yeah. is as well. <clears throat> that's fun. It's a fun film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So obviously you must be you, you. I guess you play a few instruments then, as as, as well as drums. Do you do you, do you play uh, yeah. guitars, keys, bass, whatever you need to play? I play guitar, bass. I play keys. You know, uh, synthesizers. I program. I, I'm an engineer. I do. I'm pretty much you know one man show with all this stuff, and I don't have anyone helping me. Like I, I usually engineer engineer everything I do, whether it's drums or it's film score. You know. Yeah. Because I, I know, yeah. I know you have um, a past career as as a live sound engineer as well, or part. You know, you, you I did was. It. Yeah. Do you? Do you? Ever... I did it. I did it more. Go ahead. No, no, no. You, you, you carry on. Go on. <clears throat> I did. It, I did the live sound thing for a long time. I mean, in the beginning, before really um, professionally touring and and stuff, just to keep myself alive and to keep myself, you know, surrounded in the music. So you know. I can see what's going on. I can hear what's going on. That's basically how my path was laid in front of me to get to where I'm at now was through doing live sound at clubs in New York, you know, whether it be CBGBs or Coney Island High or Wetlands or, you know, I used to get hired out a lot from uh, different bands around, around the city to do sound for them exclusively. So I built up, you know, a reputation for that. And then through that, I built up a reputation of being a drummer as well. So whenever a band needed a drummer i was always the guy they called so it that's, definitely helped you know that's incredible i mean I, I do a little bit of live sound not to the uh not to the level you've done it at but I, and i always really enjoy yeah. it um i mean yeah. cbgb's i mean th apparently the pa although you know it's known as uh, rough and ready apparently the pa in there was was actually really nice i don't know is that is that the true PA was, the, yeah the pa was great i thought it was i mean it was it wasn't stereo it was mono and it was a custom made JBL system, I think designed by someone named Charlie Martin, who used to be the head engineer at the Ritz in New York, if I'm not mistaken. I think he's the one that helped design it and put it in. Um, it was a really simple system. I mean, it had two columns of, of sub and low mid cabinets. And then across the top of the stage is all the high mid um, cabinets. And then I think four or like high end tweeters, like kind of aimed diagonally down at the crowd and i think it was like a a 24 
channel like, like soundcraft board with like four subgroups it was like a series two yeah it's like a really old soundcraft came out like 1975 i think and it had this neve style like eqs to it is what they say yes, yeah. and it had a nice punch and crunch to it i mean and you used to be able to make live board tapes because there was like a feed off the board into a into a cassette player a cassette yeah. recorder and used to charge like 10 bucks for like to take your live show and Eight, nine times out of ten, you'd have a great sounding live demo from CBs. You know, yeah. it was really simple too. There was no overhead mics. It was all SM58s with the little fuzzy, spongy things taken out, and a D112 microphone. That was the secret to the CB sound. Wow! But you know, you mentioned it. you said it wasn't <clears throat> in stereo. I, I think in a club situation, it doesn't need to be in stereo. You know, unless you're still dead center. It depends on the club. I mean, the way that club was set up, it was such a long stretch of a room. Hmm. It was pointless to have it stereo. So it made the most sense to have it mono. So it just punches you in the face. Yeah. Yeah. When you walk into the door, the first thing you hear is usually to get the, the vocals and the drums. Because by the time you get to the middle of the floor and towards the stage, you get all the guitar. Yeah. So then you get a great blend of guitar, uh, vocal and drums right then and there but mm. the further the further you're back like when like i said when you walk through the door the first thing you usually hear is drums and vocals and a little bit guitar but as you get closer you feel the full mix it's yeah. pretty incredible and usually that that middle point is like right towards like uh as you're getting to the end of the bar like by close to the end middle end of the bar the bar is on your was on your right when you walked in mm. and then at the end of the bar is where is the big uh open area where the Sometimes they'd have tables and chairs, but most of the times when I worked there, they didn't have it up there. They didn't yeah. have the tables and chairs were put off to the side in another area. Sure. But, yeah. I, f I find it hard to imagine tables and chairs in CPGVs. You just imagine, you know, well, packed in tight. Look, if you look at old, yeah, if you look at old pictures, though, that's how it started. It was like that. I think as, as you, I'm assuming as the, the bands got more energetic more crazy they just got rid of all that stuff yeah. and you know push it to the side and when i worked there it was only on and off you know i would be there covering for other engineers that would be taken out taken off you know going to work somewhere else or mm -hmm. i would do like a week there and stuff like that but most of the time when i worked in that place i was hired out by bands and i played there you know yeah. numerous times in the, in the past before even being an engineer just at all the punk shows sure. with my old band nausea yeah, 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 of course. Well, well, we'll we'll get there in a minute. But what what an amazing I was lucky to be around it. Oh, an amazing thing to have say you've engineered there wetlands. You know these legendary names that 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 are yeah. that live forever. You know, um, yeah. <clears throat> do you find as a live and a, and a you know a studio um, engineer? Do you have to be careful? Obviously, being a drummer, not to not to push drums a bit too high up in the mix. I find myself having to, as a drummer, and I'm always thinking, is this am I am I pushing the drums too much here? Is that a thing you've ever thought of or not? Sometimes, but I'll reference to like Andy Wallace's mix on Nevermind for Nirvana, and the drums are fucking loud as shit, mm. and the vocals are on top, guitars and bass are right there. I usually use that as a reference of if I'm going too loud or not. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, that's an old, old mix, but I mean, the way I mix is nothing like Andy Wallace, but I definitely use him as a reference. And I don't think, I think drums and bass should be loud. It should be the foundation of the song, you know, depends on the, on the kind of band. If you're mixing something like, say, a Neil Diamond song or a Neil Young song, you're not going to make the drums punchy as fuck. It's not about them. It's mm -hmm. about Neil Diamond and Neil Young. You're going to yeah. make their voice and their instrumentation a little bit more present and the drums a little bit lower. You know, not as dominant. Like, but if you were to do something like, I don't know, like Zeppelin, or even like ACDC, drums and bass got to be fucking punching. Guitars yeah, yeah. just ride in that middle frequency yeah. where everything sits. So, I mean, drums and bass. I mean, that's that's the foundation. That's got to be really prominent, especially with rock music or metal. You know what I mean? That's, like, that's, that's really, it depends. Really interesting. Yeah, I, I I could talk about this all day, but we've wandered a bit yeah. off. The, the topic of drums, but you know, no, 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 no. This is this is all relevant. Trust yeah, me. and all it's all part of your career as well. So I, 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 I would happily talk about this all day. So uh, yeah, anyway, but look, let, let's let's go back to kind of where where your first memories of music, if you like. I mean, forget drums <clears> for now. What what's your first memories of music, Roy? 
my first memory is of music. I mean, as far back as I can remember, I mean, being really little, like in a crib, little, mm. like probably like two or two years old, at least. Uh, I can remember my mom playing a lot of, you know, current top 40 and soul and R&B music that was around the time, you know, like just 45s, yeah, seven yeah. inches. Everything from like Stevie Wonder to Curtis Mayfield, uh, you know, stuff like that, you know, and I'll listen to Neil, Neil Diamond because of her and Burt Baccarat and weird shit like that. That's not weird shit, but you know, <laughs> it's, it's funny to mention them now, you know, but it, sure. it, they're amazing musicians and I still think they're great, especially the earlier Neil Diamond stuff, the 60s Diamond stuff. Yeah. And Burt Baccarat's a genius. Um, the Beatles, of course, that was always in my life. The Beatles have been part of my life always and a huge fan because of my mom playing Beatles for me all the time. So that was my first memories of music. And after that, um, I think once I was more conscious of what, of my surroundings and more music, probably around five, six, four, five, six, around that time, I have an older brother who's, uh, at the time was 14 or 15. He was really into, you know, rock and Hard rock, as they called it back then, you know, Zeppelin, ACDC, Sabbath. Those are the bands that I grew to because of him. And then there's Kiss. Kiss is what is what dominated my years the whole time in the mid 70s. I wanted to be just like that when I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. You know, that was my 70s. My 70s life, uh, you know, my music, my music uh, knowledge from my 70s as a kid, you know, I was into all that. I was into hard rock, which be considered classic rock. Sure, sure. Now, so uh, yeah. in in the seventies, then what what was your? Did you have a favorite Kiss album? Yeah, Rock and Roll Over. Oh, okay, and right. the reason and the reason being because that was the first record <clears throat> that I got. That's the first record that I discovered him on. Like I saw them. I think I saw them first on TV before even getting that record. They, I think they just came out with Destroyer at that time. Bands used to put out two records a year, which is yeah. insane. Yeah, and saw them. <laughs> yeah, and saw them both. Um, yeah. I think the first time I'd seen, I'll explain how, how I discovered Kiss. My brother came home from school, high school. I was already home. He was with a bunch of his friends, and one of his friends had Destroyer under his arm. Walked past me as I was watching like cartoons, and I saw the the cartoony image on the record. I'm like, "Whoa, what is that?" So I started walking behind him. You know, six year old me, but sixteen year old kid. As I got to the door, my brother looked at me. He's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like. I want to come and listen to that record. Like, oh, no, no, no. This kid, get, this gets you nightmares, kid. Get out of here. Slammed the door in my face. I'm just like, the fuck? I remember putting my ear to the door and I can hear God of Thunder for the first time. And I was like, oh. Yeah. And then I actually questioned my brother more on it. Like, I wanted to know more about Kiss like later on. And then one day later that week, they were on Don Kirshner's rock concert at like 1130 at night, or 12, midnight. And I was late for a little kid to, to, to see that. So my brother used to stay up late and he woke me up at like midnight, 1130. He's like, Hey, Kiss is on TV. And I saw Kiss for the first time on TV. And I was just like, okay, I'm in. And then that year, my brother got me that rock and roll album, rock and roll over album for Christmas. And that was it. Wow. I had the sticker, put it on my, put it on my, on my bass drum, on my kick drum, pretend I was in Kiss, you know, you know did, play did, to that record every <laughs> fucking day after, after, after school, man. Like I wore that record out. I have a bunch of copies of that record still. Because that's like my favorite record. That record from top to bottom, I think, is the, in my opinion, the best Kiss record. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. love Destroyer um, Alive, of course. But this, there's not many. Oh, Alive. Yeah, it's not many bad albums, is there? Alive, uh, Alive is the ruler. Um, <clears throat> Destroyer, though, as a whole, in my opinion, I was never, never really too keen on it. I, I love the first side, mm. obviously. Well. Sorry, but I'm not into great expectations. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm not into not into flaming youth. I'm not into what's the other one? Uh, God, I can't remember. Shout it out loud. I love and do you love me? Yeah. Those songs are just yeah great. But as a whole, rock and roll over for me, top to bottom. Not not a bad song on it. It's yeah. all just driving. Well, I, I think Kiss record. I think the first song I ever played live with a band was called Gin. So that's the oh, big, yeah. big part of my life as well when I was growing up, you know? Oh, those first four records are magic, and especially the Kiss Alive version of all those songs, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. 
they're, they're it's magic. And the first album, I, it's funny you're talking about Kiss because I was on some podcast thing with with uh, with a bunch of guys uh, with Charlie Benante from Anthrax and 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 Mike Portnoy and uh, this other guy Paul Gargano and and uh, and uh, Presley. We were all doing um, um, like a shootout on all those first three records, and the first album won. Really. Wow. Out of three. Did, did, and then we did and then, and then we did the next three would have been um would have been Destroyer, uh Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun, Rock yeah, and Roll yeah. Over one. Yeah. Did, did, Which I knew and I called it from the beginning and they all told me, like, ah, you don't know nothing. And it won. <laughs> well, <laughs> but that was a fun, that was fun, that was a fun time. I'll bet. Did Charlie talk about going to audition or trying to audition for KISS? He asked funny. He didn't even he, he didn't he didn't mention that. But I know he's an Uber Kiss fan. Like he's as big as a Kiss fan. Like actually, him, Mike Portnoy, well, Portnoy and myself are we're massive Kiss fans. But those guys are huge Kiss fans. They have insane like paraphernalia. They have so many collectibles. It's insane. Sure. Yeah. I well, thought I had a lot. They have tons. Yeah. Well, I had Charlie on uh, a couple of years ago now, and uh, I mentioned Kiss, and he said, oh, he said, well, when when Peter Chris left and Eric Carr joined, he went to the uh, audition um, Oh, all right. as a 16-year-old or a 15-year-old, and they were like, nah, no, wow. no, no, no. You can just imagine, uh, you know, this young guy turning up. But but they said they, they saw they saw Eric Carr go in and, and obviously he got the gig and what have you. And so I know he's a massive Kiss fan. So it's, it's really cool. That's so cool. I had, I had no idea about that. I'm going to ask him about that next time. Yeah, I talk dude, because he's pretty cool. I, I don't know if he'd wow. shared it on any other podcast, but he gave me that that little bit of a uh, little bit of a gem there. So that was really cool to, to hear, you know. That's pretty cool. Yeah. He's great. I love Charlie. Charlie's the best. Charlie and Mike oh, are awesome. Great guys. So where did yeah. where did drums start then? I mean, what what was the first um first moment? Drums, drums? was definitely drums, uh, the first moment with drums. Um uh, well with me, I was, I was I I can remember well, my mom remembers. I've always constantly like beating up my edge of my crib and and she noticed that I had this rhythm thing going on and every time like you know, she'd play, you know, music, like especially when you, she started playing the more groovier stuff like superstition and all that stuff. I'm always, you know, banging along to that. And then um there's another time where we're at a I can remember this. I'm just remembering this now. Being with my my brother and my dad on a weekend, we were at a at a flea market and I can remember seeing an old drum kit that was there just beat up. And I remember going to it and just beating it with my hands, stomping on the kick pedal. And I remember my dad like kind of ripping me away from that kind of like, now we're not buying that. <laughs> and then like a year later, I think you know, it was about six, like right that same year I got the rock and roll over record. My mom got me a, a, a toy drum kit, a Sterling beat kit. It was made out of like tin and had a really like thin mylar on it where you just, kind of break it after a while so that was my first kit and that's when i really started nailing hitting drums more around yeah. six and then a few years after that once that kit was just demolished i i got a real drum kit like like a like a, a, a chinese knockoff of a of a, a ludwig mm. like a blue sparkle blue four-piece kit like i think a 20-inch kick drum 12-inch tom 16-inch floor 14 inch snare, one crash symbol. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And that crash symbol is still in that same position. Really? That'll never change. Never change. But well, you know what? The core of my drum kit is never changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, when people look at it, like, yeah, your kit's changed a lot. I'm like, yeah, it has, but the core of it, the four has not yeah. changed. The snare, tom, kick, and floor, that's still there. It's always added extra stuff, you know? So you could take yeah. you could take the extra stuff away and it would still reveal that original setup. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yep. Uh, that, that's the ultimate way to do it, though, isn't it? Build around what you're already used to and what you like, and then add rather than trying to exactly. Change. Yeah, that's that's the best. Way. I mean, I wasn't conscious of it. It's just something that I instinctively just done. But when I look back on it, I'm like, okay, I just basically just built around what I normally play. So okay, hmm. you know, some people just extremely change their setups but i find that uh unnecessary just get what you have and just build around it sure you know? and did you do that Works for me did you do that thing you do as a youngster 
get an add on drums with different colors and different brands and just add stuff to, to <laughs> end up with this, you know, giant pile yeah. of crap. Yeah, you get. <laughs> You, you just yeah you, you just get whatever you can get i like i had like four different cymbal companies like five different sets of drumsticks i mean whatever you can get you know, we yeah. didn't have money and my friends that had stuff that they were getting rid of they would give me hand-me-downs like our neighbor next door was moving to college he gave me all of his cymbals and then i'm like oh my god i have a hi-hat i have two extra crashes Woo! i have a set of cowbells great i could do that neil pert working man drum solo finally you know i mean <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> and this is this is this is around that time like when i got the when i got the blue kit i think i was eight but i was like nine nine or ten when i got all that extra stuff I'm like oh my god a hi-hat you know and i started with using a hi-hat because from until then i was only the crash symbol sure and a four-piece sure. kit That's it. oh amazing simple so yeah. did you <laughs> did you do any uh, any lessons or studying with anybody or did you just do it just playing along in the old fashioned way for the most part the old fashioned way but there was a point here and there where I did take some lessons but I I never stuck with the teacher because most of the time the teachers weren't really keen on teaching an 8 year old you know what I mean especially the 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 more uptight Jazz players, you know what I mean? They don't want to teach a kid that wants to play match grip and rock. You know what I mean? I'd walk in with these records. They're like, you're not going to, you don't want to play any of that. Like, you don't want to hold your sticks like that. You want to hold your sticks like this. I'm like, no, I want to hold my sticks like that. Yeah. Well, you got to hold your sticks like this. if You want to play drums. I'm like, all right. So then I would do that for a week. And then I would just kind of give up and move on to the next teacher. And then finally I found a teacher when I was about eight or nine, something like that. This rock drummer guy. His name is uh, his name? Charlie Sino. Mm -hmm. And I just remembered that because I'd just been looking for him for years and I found his name on the, on the internet and I actually located him on Facebook, but he hasn't, he hasn't gotten back to me. And they're like, oh, he's my, my teacher. I want to talk to him. Like, I haven't seen him. I, 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 he was my teacher like in 1978. So anyway, I walk into this, you know, local music store, you know, I had a couple records with me. I, you know, probably just at that time, 78 summertime, I probably would have bought Double Platinum by Kiss. So I oh, had the yes. Kiss record in my hand, you know, which is you know, a compilation. So I walk in, you know, into this music store and, you know, just checking, you know, checking out the drum you know, with my brother. He's checking out the guitar. And I see this, this six foot big guy with long, shaggy, like, you know, hard, hard rock metal hair, you know, with big, you know, aviator glasses. I'm like, oh, okay, looks cool. And he walks over to me. He's like, "Hey, you got that? You're into Kiss, right?" I'm like, "Yeah, I love Kiss." He's like, "He's like, oh, I play drums, you know." I'm like, "I play drums too." He's like, oh, "I'm a teacher here." He's like, "Oh, great, you're a teacher." So then, you know, I decided to go with him for some lessons. So I walk in, you know, the next day with my records. I'm like, "Hey, I want to learn how to play this." He's like, "Oh, it's great, you know." So let's, you know, I'll teach you form, I teach you technique, and you know, teach you the rudiments, and then then we'll get to play the records, you know. So that was the deal, and I did that for a whole month with them, and then. uh yeah, he taught me a lot. He just taught me, you know, all the forms, all the rudiments. And then he went on tour and I never seen him again. And then I just kind of took whatever he told, taught me and just went with it from there. And then just mm -hmm. did it on my own and just played the records and did the rudiments. And that's it. I never took lessons again after that. So, so, the, so the only reason you stopped with him is because he went on tour rather than you saying, oh, that's, I've had enough now. You were quite happy, I'm guessing. Yeah, but also we were we also just we also ran out of time like right after he left, we also moved to a different state. Okay. A few months later. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of teachers around, but those are the teachers I was talking about that wanted to teach me match grip, you know what I mean, as well. So I'm like I mean uh, uh traditional grip and I'm like, nah, so I just kinda of continued on my own and just continued to play to my records. At that time it would have been like like I would probably would have been playing to Cheap Trick, Dream Police, or Highway to Hell, ACDC, uh, what else was I playing to? I started playing to to uh, Devo and Ramones. Like, that was my gateway into punk. So I started shying away oh. from hard rock into okay. punk. Yeah. You know? So from, like, 1980 on, that was all into post-punk. Well, what you guys would call post-punk at the time, I called it punk. Right. To me, it was, like, Killing Joke and Joy Division. I was playing to stuff like, like that yeah, you know, at sure. 10 years old. Um, cause it just kind of had more of an impact on me, you know, when I first heard it, I'm like, this is so cool sounding and weird and different and not popular. You know, it doesn't feel like old people music because cheap trick felt miles away from me. Like I, I didn't, I wasn't sure if I can, you know, 
be that, but I can be that. Yeah. I could play Sex Pistols. I could play like Paul Cook. Cool. I'm into that. I like the ruts. Awesome. I'll continue with that. I you love the buzzcocks. Ah, wow, great. Wow. So a lot, lot, of, lot of the British stuff then. I was heavily into British um, punk and post-punk music at that time. Because my brother, like my brother uh, was really into that music. So I just kind of followed what he was, he was into. He pointed me in the right direction mm. of, you know, what he was listening to. So I kind of took the money and run with that stuff and started figuring out my own bands, you know, from there. Great drummer. Was it Dave Ruffy uh, from the Roots? Yeah. Uh, yeah, great yeah. drummer. Really good drummer. Yeah, and then, and, then there's, and then there's Pete DeFreitas, you know, rest in peace, from Echo and the Bunnymen, which I really loved. Yeah. Uh, Paul Ferguson from Killing Joke. Great drummer still, and actually we know each other pretty well. He's a really good guy and an amazing drummer. One of my favorite drummers. Cool. Well, I, I had sure. um, I had on as a guest, uh, I think it was before Christmas, uh, Budgie from Susie and the Banshees, which was quite cool. Cause Budgie, Love him too. Budgie doesn't do many interviews, and I was um, uh, I was very, very, very lucky to get him. It was um, – who got me? Budgie. It was um, Steve Grantley from Stiff Little Fingers who got, got hold of Budgie for me, so that was cool. I love that band too, man. Hey, that, you're, you you're speaking my language. Yeah. Budgie, though, man. Yeah, definitely a unique drummer, man. Like just the, totally. the drumming he does on Happy House is like probably one of my favorite yeah. uh, riffs he does. Amazing. Yeah. Just, um, so that you're setting the scene. So where where did you um, where did you grow up then, Roy? It's weird because we kind of moved around a lot, you know. And then once my parents got divorced, we um, we went from New York City. Uh, and then we lived in Florida for a few years. My, my dad got a job down there. And then my parents got divorced in like 79 or something like that. And then we moved back up north to Pennsylvania. Hmm. Couldn't afford to live in New York because it was just too expensive. So we lived in Pennsylvania, just outside of Philly. And I stayed there from like 1979 to about 88. And then I moved to New York City on my own. But in between that, I used to go up. I used to go up to New York and Philadelphia and just, you know, get check out the scene of music and see shows and stuff like that. From when I was like sixteen on, so I, for the most part, I kind of lived everywhere. And then I lived in New York from like proper from like eighty eight to about ninety nine. And then I moved to moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. So I've been here I, ever since for 23 years. I heard that yeah. um, post you being in, in nausea about um, about squatting <laughs> in New York. Now, yeah, I did that for a while too. I, I I find this hard to imagine what that must be like. I mean, describe it to us. It wasn't I easy. No, I can imagine. So... Just tell us how how that. It's not, it's not like it's not like it's not like squatting in 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 Europe or or, or England, man. Like it, it's it's definitely really run down and really difficult. You know, it, 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 it was really rough. But I did it just to, you know for a couple reasons, just for the statement of of making the statement of uh, claiming a place that's going to waste and making it a home, and also I used it as a as a place to just kind of get my shit together until I got a job and saved up some money and got my own place. And I did that very quickly because I, when I was living at these squats, I would come home a lot of my, a lot of times my shit would be gone, you know, you know, yeah. money or clothes or whatever. I'm like, I can't do this. Anymore. That, that anyway. was one of the things and, I was going to because it's not, it's not a safe environment, is it? You know, you no. It's, it's. I guess it's a. It's not as atmosphere. organized. It's not as. It's not as organized as it would be in Europe. Like I said, like when I and I found this because when we when I was with Nausea and we came and toured in Europe hmm. uh, for the first time and saw we played only the, only the squats and punk rock sure. clubs. I couldn't believe how organized all these places were. I was like, wow. I wish it was like that back hmm. home. I mean, if it wasn't. It was, I mean, most of the times the squats that I lived in were just used as fucking drug ends or whatever you know yeah sure there's a group of people that wanted to do it for the right reasons but there was a bunch of people there that just used it for the wrong reasons and i just wasn't into that anymore you know so you're in a squat right you're playing drums what do you do with your gear at this point do you keep it somewhere else or yeah our stuff used to stay at, at um you know, at our singer's house because you know she had a an actual place where she, an actual house, so yeah. she would live like I think she lived in like Staten Island at the time. So our our stuff would just stay there. She had a garage, 
Yeah, so you knew that was safe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how how did the nausea thing come about? Obviously, were you aware of the band before you joined them? Were you a fan anyway? I was aware of nausea. I was definitely aware of nausea before. I was actually, I was, a, I was a fan. I was really into them. I still saw them a bunch of times before joining the band. And I, how I got into the band was actually through a mutual friend. I was living with this guy named Sean Roberts in, um, in Philadelphia just before moving to New York properly. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was really good friends with nausea. And he knew I was looking for a, a band and looking to get back into New York and, or find a reason to go back to New York, not just to live there, but just to have a reason to be there. And his and John John at the time, the bass player of Nausea, is saying, oh, yeah, we just lost our drummer. We're looking for a drummer. And Sean's like, hey, I know the guy. I know the guy. So get me in contact with them. I came up. I borrowed $20 from my friend Sean, jumped on the – Except the New Jersey transit train, you know, uh, got dropped off at Port Authority, took another subway, met met up with, with uh, John John and um, met up with him at, the, at his place of work and stayed over. And then the next day I auditioned and then I got the gig and I went back home, packed my shit up and came back. You know, I only showed up with a pair of sticks and like some money. That was it. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Yeah, it was it was it was fun. So I just moved up with a duffel bag and a dr- and a set of drums. That's it. Incredible. So I had. See, I'm guessing you knew a lot yeah. of the set anyway, so it was quite an easy transition to join. Um, I, I knew a couple of their songs, but I actually got a demo tape from them first to listen to and, and practice it. That's how I. And then I, I showed up, yeah. knowing it more. Yeah, yeah of course. So did yeah. you? Because you played on. Um, you played on Extinction, didn't you? I played on all the recordings, all the proper oh, right. recordings. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I played Extinction. on Extinction. Extinction. That was my first proper record. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I was going to ask, um, th- there's, um, oh gosh, the opening track, te- uh, Technologic Kill. Technologic Kill. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, I'm hearing, obviously you'd have been playing double bass at that point because there's lots of like, um, Lots of like roughs and grace notes and yeah. yeah I yeah. just started playing double bass. That that would have been like my my first year into playing double bass when that when I discovered that there was a, a DW the D drum workshop DW was making a double pedal. I'm like I gotta have that. I can't yeah. afford another kick drum, or nor do I have a, a room for another kick drum. So yeah. because of DW, I was able to have double bass. But I just started pretty much at that time. If you just started, then it sounds so fluent and smooth. Because I was going to say you'd been playing double Thank bass you. for a long time at that point. Because it does; it just kind of yeah. it just fits really nicely. So that was the start of it, the double bass stuff. Wow, for, for me, yeah, and I'm still learning. <laughs> no, I think you're doing you know, more than that. But we're uh, always still learning. We're all still trying to hone, you know, hone in our craft a bit more. You know what I mean? I'm always practicing that. You know, there's so many techniques out there with double bass and stuff like that i think i was more caveman with my double bass back then and just using my legs more than my my ankles and like a combination of, of both and now it's like the way i do double bass now it's more swivel and it's everything you know it depends on the situation if i'm playing slower a little bit a little bit a little bit closer to the top of the footboard and yeah more caveman and a little faster a little bit further back and more swivel you know like i have it somewhat worked out but i'm still still figuring it out to these to this day you know but it it worked. But, what you yeah. played worked so well, um, and it, it just sounds. And I I was really interested to hear it. I thought oh, I wonder, you know, how how long he'd been doing that, and it just it fit great. So tell me, what, oh, what sort of you. gigs? What sort of gigs were you doing with Nausea? What what kind of venues were you playing at the time? Um. Well, we were playing places like CBs, yeah. you know, and we we'd play like those kind of places, and we didn't do big tours just yet. We were doing a lot of weekend tri-state area stuff, like like you know, play the Rat in Boston, or we'd play uh, the Anthrax in Connecticut. Play like you know, places like Revival in in, in Philadelphia, and well, you know, places like that, um, CBGBs. And then the, the first big tour we did was the it was the European tour. That was like a month and a month and a half. Yeah, and we were in a van and played all the squats, and then. The next tour we did after that, we played West Coast, just all of like uh, West Coast of uh, America, just uh, California, Oregon, Seattle, 
we did just one week and a half there and then that was it we never did anything else after that we never played we never played in a like middle you know texas or chicago or anything like that oh. by the time we were by the time we started getting our 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 you know our wheels rolling we stopped you know <laughs> it was wild how this band just, just stopped we did one more tour in europe in 91 and that was it and we kind of broke up after that yeah it's 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 these things happen though don't they and i know you went to form you went on to form thorn didn't you afterwards with john john again and now it, it now yeah. I, had, I had to go to wikipedia for this and it said you were signed <laughs> after four live performances is that is that correct that's true it's true yeah it was weird we were signed after a few just a few performances on to roadrunner records we made one record and didn't do anything after that. That's we played shame, a isn't it? bunch of shows. Yeah, I mean, because the, the band didn't 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 do anything. Yeah, the record didn't do anything. It's unfortunate. I mean, it was it was a fun record to make. I mean, we made it at Electric Lady Studios of all studios. Oh it was wow! A properly made record. Yeah. Uh, our fr- our friend John Travis, uh, uh, the guy who produced the record, he's still one of my best friends to this day. Um, that was his first production credit, and he got us into the studio because he knew the he knew the, the the manager who ran the studio and really mm-hmm. got us a good rate in there and so of course we're like yeah we had the we had the budget to do it and we recorded there mm-hmm. so right. that was my second time you know in a proper studio before that was uh, when i did the first nausea record cool. and a, a couple records after that which we did with wharton tears i don't know if you're familiar with him he produced and engineered a lot of stuff from sonic youth and oh. A lot of the local, you know, no wave kind of New York bands. I think he actually used to play in Glenn Bronca's band. He was a drummer oh, in that band. Okay, right. Okay. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he was in that band. Yeah. So then, obviously, I know you've done lots of things in between, but we'll be here for about eight hours if we talk about all of it. But <laughs> so the, much stuff. <laughs> yeah, it, it's an amazing. Yeah, you've got an amazing, um, amazing career behind you so far, and it, you know, there's a lot to talk about. But the, the 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 first time I really became aware of you was Soulfly, and um, yeah, that was a, a it's one heavy band. Um, so you set that you set that up, didn't you, with Max? That was your kind of your thing. Am I, have I got that right? Well, it, he set it up. It's his band. He he recruited me. But you were so, an original um, member, yeah. is what I'm, is what? Yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the first guy. I was the first guy in the band. After he he he, he had a, I remember he um. He'd sent me through to Monty, the A and R guy. Through Monty, he sent me a, a demo, four song demo, which would have been the first three songs on on the first album, like mm. "Eye for an Eye," and yeah. I think it was uh, "No." And actually, no, it's only two songs on that demo that made it onto onto uh, the, the album because the other one was "Primitive," which would have okay. ended up on the second album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had these four songs, and I learned them and. Uh, it was just a guitar and drum machine, really simple. And I just basically took it and made it more, gave it more life as a drummer. And I showed up to Arizona, learned a bunch of simple tour songs, just, of course, because that's, he wanted to just try me and make sure, you know, yeah, I could do this. And we played those songs and played his new songs and just did punk covers all day long and just high fived. And <laughs> I went back home and I came back and he had a, he, he found a bass player. Um, which, which is his uh, old lighting technician for Sepultura, Marcelo Diaz, and then that's we went from there, formed from there. Because it was it was an amazingly amazing band, but a heavy band, but with some. I mean, I I hear uh, no hope, no fear, and I'm hearing, especially when the vocals come in, I'm hearing like kind of hip hop kind of grooves going on in there and all sorts of stuff. Is that is that fair? Is that a fair comment? Would you say? Oh, sure. I mean, I I don't. I, I can I can hear what you're saying, but that's yeah. not that's not where my head was at. I mean, there was no, definitely no. hip hop. Hip hop was definitely in the background while we're recording a lot of this stuff because at that time, I mean, everyone was listening to Wu Tang and all that mm-hmm. shit. So hip hop was definitely in the background. Hip hop's always been in in my life. You know, even uh-huh. when I was you know living living on the East Coast in Pennsylvania or in New York, hip hop was always in the background with 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 punk. It was it was it was from the street. It was raw like punk. So I loved hip hop, you know. Mm. I love that version of hip hip hop. Mm. So it's in there. So yeah. you're, you're technically right. It's in there. I, mean, yeah. I grew up listening to to funk and soul. So yeah, it's in there. It's just groove. Um, it's just, it's just funny, such a cool groove. Oh, thank you. 
It's funny you mentioned that song because that's the first song I can remember that we all wrote together. Oh wow! Okay, that came that came out of nowhere. I, I can remember being at rehearsal, you know, showing up to rehearsal one day as while we're writing for the record. Max just comes out with that fucking riff that and 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 I jump in just like how I did on the record, and the whole band jumped in. It was magic. I can remember we're all looking at each other like, yeah, that's the sound. That's a real soulfly sound right there. Is that to me? That song represents that that version for sure. It was so it was so organic how Max just pulled that riff out of his ass and, and <laughs> created this insane song. So that, once we got that part, we got the second part, and then we all just kind of arranged it together. And, and what you hear now is what we all arranged together. Well, that for, for yeah. me, that's my favorite track on the album. I, I just love it. And it me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. From a drummer's standpoint, definitely one of my favorites to play. And I still play it. I mean, I play it at soundtracks just to just to check the kick and snare and the toms. It's the perfect kick, snare, toms soundtrack oh. song, I, I think, you know. It's, it's um, amazing. Actually, the, 20, the 25th anniversary of that record's coming up uh, this year in a few months. It's not, is it? Really? Yeah. 25 years. We recorded it in, uh, maybe longer. We recorded it in 97, but it came out in 98. That's, I'll that's, probably do a video for that. <laughs> that's terrifying. Um, I didn't. I thought it was about ten, fifteen years. That's really scary. Wow. No, I was I was twenty seven years old when I did that. Hmm. Yeah, and of course, yeah, because um, Max was still in uh, Sepultura at that point. No, he wasn't. Was he not? I thought he. No, I thought no. He well, he, he. No, he quit Sepultura in. Uh, 96, 97, and that's when he, he started solo play. Ah, I thought I thought it was later than that, right? Okay, I see. Yeah. Ah, okay. My mistake. There we are. Um, and then a band I have to talk about is is, and it must have been an interesting one for you. Um, obviously, I, I have to be careful how I word this because um, mm. <laughs> I'm going to talk hell yeah, and and I don't want to say. Um, taking over from replacing, I don't know what the right way of putting it is, but sitting in, sitting in, sitting yeah. in, yeah. There's no replacing, no, there's no, no taking over. You see I'm why just, I struggled? I'll, 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 I'll put it to you this way: I just borrowed a hat, yeah. and I'm helping out. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the way to address that. Yeah, respectively. You see why I struggled to <laughs> to put it? I was like, I don't know how to. <laughs> No, that's all right. I mean, it, it was it was definitely. Um, hey, well, I'll tell you this much: I was reluctant to wanting to do it because of just I had my reservations of doing it. You know, I just thought it was, you know, strange. You know, because he was my friend, and uh, yeah. I don't. I, I don't. <laughs> it was just weird to be in a place that was his for me at the time, yeah. and play with his band. You know, so. But after, you know, a week of thinking about it, I mean, well, I got the call, obviously, because they want me to do it. And I'm going to spiritually think that he wants me to do it. So yeah. that's why I'm going to do it. So then, yeah. I'm, so then, of course, I've accepted and learned all his, his weird, crazy Vinnyism chops and stuff like that, which he has a lot of. Because his, oh, his yeah. drumming, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, imitate it. But it's definitely hard to do, you know. He does a lot of weird stuff where... He leads a pattern. He'll, he'll lead with his left in the middle of a pattern. Like you have to play it that way, otherwise it's not going to sound right. Yeah. And I knew this because I was lucky enough to get um, cam drum cam footage from from uh, their videographer, so I'm able to really see where his hands and feet are going. Hmm. And it's incredible. I mean, I always, I mean, he's always been one of my favorite drummers and great, great guy. And really inspiring to listen to him play over, over all, all those years but to actually watch him from behind do it it's pretty wild yeah just yeah. just phenomenal and i tried my best to, to get it i tried my best to get it as close as possible so you know you don't have any dog ears from the band you know what i mean just to keep them comfortable and that was basically my role in the band yeah you know it, it, it was you must have found it challenging to to work some of them parts out and get oh, yeah. them found in because, as you say, he's pretty, he, he was pretty unique, wasn't he? What he did. He, he, there's some drummers that you hear and you go, oh, "That's such and such." That's this this guy. And you always knew 
you always knew when it was Vinnie Paul. It was like, yeah, that's no brainer, you know. He's got a groove. He's he's got this. He's got this certain groove, you know. It's 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 hard to imitate someone. You can only be you can only be yourself. You can, mm-hmm. I mean, you can play other people's parts, but you're never going to sound like them. Yeah, like there's thousands of people there trying to sound like Bonham, me included. You're never <laughs> going to sound like him. No, but you, you can you can try. You know. Yeah. There's a certain feel and touch. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a weight issue there too. Bottom is also like two times the size of me too. So he's, <laughs> he's got naturally this this yeah. weight that gives him that groove. Of course. You know, course. while I'm trying to make that groove, you know what I mean? That's an, just for an example. Same thing with, with Vinny, you know, he's, he's a little bit, you know, stockier. So he had a, he wasn't really laying into it, but he was laying into it because that's just how heavy his arms are. Yeah. And that's why he just sounded so powerful. You know, uh, when you're watching him do it, he's just like, He's just doing it, but he's fucking hitting hard, man. <laughs> he, he just, um, he, I just was hitting his, hard. I love his, I, I've loved everything with Pantera. Ev, just everything he's ever done has just been great. And it must have been, I say, it must Amazing. have been strange for you, but but it must have been a thrill definitely. as well. You know, it was definitely strange. I mean, there's definitely times where I'm sitting behind a kid playing and not thinking about it, just in in my you know drummer instinct mode. But then there'll be times where I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm actually here doing this yeah for them. it's weird and it really hits me harder more when the video uh, uh the, the the life video comes up in, in in the middle of the set and that's when it gets really emotional it's like wow this guy really isn't isn't here anymore right it's yeah yeah fucking horrible and just you know reading his band members and you know seeing how what they're like and it was pretty emotional for them you know it was heavy it was a heavy tour for sure, but it was so, it was beautiful at the same time. Oh, you know? I'm sure. The, 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 so, yeah, you would have toured. It would have been the Welcome Home album, then I guess that was the tour. Yeah, yeah, that was the last record he recorded. So, yeah, it would have yeah, yeah. Welcome Home, and we played a bunch of Pantera songs, and you know, it's good for for his uh, celebration. I mean, that album yeah. is great. I love the song "Bury You." I just think it's just a great album, uh, from a great song from that good record. Oh, it's a really good record. Did you uh, were you kind of made welcome by the fans? Because obviously they'd appre- they'd have appreciated it. It was a tricky one for you that you know, especially as you I was a- actually. Believe it or not, I I got nothing but love from their fans. Mm. You know, and and uh, that's that's cool. It felt it felt nice. You know, I got nothing but love from them. Yeah. yeah. Do you think anything will ever happen again with Hell Yeah, or is it is it just who knows? I, who knows? I mean, it's, it's not for me to say. That's up to them, and I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. You know, cause I think they're all. They all kind of went their separate ways. You know. Mm. I mean, Chad's doing Mudvayne, and I don't really know what what Kyle and uh, uh, Tom and Christian are doing. You know, but I, I haven't heard from any of them about doing anything. So I don't think oh. so. Hey, you never know, dear. You yeah. never know. You uh, never know. No. And there's one glaring band which I've just kind of saved to last. Obviously, Stone Sour. Um, mm. How did that one come about? That this one interests me because <laughs> I think that an that incredible was incredible band. That was out of that was out of nowhere. So I got a call from Nick Rescue Lennox. Uh, he's the one that was producing come whatever may at the time. Um, he also was producer for for Rush and Hailstorm and you know many other cool bands. Uh, him and I were really good friends. Um, gave me a call one day saying they needed they needed a drummer to come in and you know play some drums on the record, mm-hmm. and I didn't know anyone from Adam except for Corey, who I you know sort of knew just from you know you know Soulfly and you know Roadrunner you know records when I was around that you know when I was part of that mm-hmm. at that time. Um, so I came in, you know, did the did the album you know within four four or five days something like that. And then uh, a week later, I got a call back to join the band full time. Wow. And then the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. Um, I mean, was that was that at a much higher level than things you've done in the past? I mean, I, I don't mean musical wise, perhaps. I mean, gig wise and, and touring wise. Oh, yeah. Did, did things go up a notch for that? Definitely way, way higher profile for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 100 percent. Yeah. Was different. Well, the difference was is that I was actually made a member of the band. Yeah, I wasn't a hired gun. Yeah, like I was for for Soulfly and anything else I've done in between. Yeah. I was actually a member of actual member 
making a decision, yeah. getting a full proper cut you know, like yeah. everyone else. Yeah. So it was it was great. I've never had anything like that. And the fact that they offered that to me uh, outright was absolutely mind blowing and incredible. I mean, I, I was like, "Are you serious?" They're like, "Yeah, we want you to be part of the band." I'm like, mm. "Well, I'm in." You know, get a cut uh, of the merch and everything. I love, I, <laughs> everything. Um, I love the music. I, I, I love what I did on the record and everything else after that. And you know, you were a great fit. Great time. You were a great fit. Thank for you. It. Appreciate uh, it. No, just you know, you've had, and I, I say this, I say this carefully. I say you've had an incredible career, and you've got a lot more ahead of you. You know, you, you fit, you fitted so many, so much things in 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 a, in a relatively short time. Who knows? Who knows where it's going to end yeah. up? You know, you just yeah. I, I yeah. bet if if you'd have told um, you know ten or twelve year old Roy that you were going to do all these things, it would have been like yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, no, I'm not. Ten, twelve years old, I was still in my bedroom, just nailing my drums to whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wishing. But um, you've yeah. been done it and still continue to do it at the highest level. So you know, I take my hat off to you. It, incredible, just, just brilliant. Um, so thank you, yeah. thank you for for talking to us. I really, really appreciate it, and um, hopefully, look forward to seeing you if you're ever over in the UK. Hopefully, we can um, get together and I can shake your hand for doing it. For sure, definitely. You're in Wales, you said, right? North Wales, yeah. So I kind of, if if it was daytime now, I'd be looking out of my window, uh, looking over the bay to Liverpool. So uh, I'm not too far from Liverpool. And uh, oh, right on, cool. Yeah, so that's cool. Is that close to Cardiff or anything like that? I am. It's actually easier for me to get to London than Cardiff. Um, really? Yeah, Cardiff is probably four and a half hours for me. It's really bad roads, so. Mm. London, I can probably do in about four hours to London. So yeah, we're we're kind of at the opposite end of of Wales. Then South Wales, we're North Wales. So uh, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, so I'm kind of like forty five awesome. minutes from Liverpool, sixty minutes from Manchester. So not too far. I'm quite quite nice, quite, perfect, quite well situated. <laughs> perfect. Look, awesome. Roy, thank you so much again, and thanks once again to John Tempesta for uh, for connecting us up. So um, thank you very much. See you soon. Have a great day. See you later. You too, my man. Thanks, Thanks brother. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks.